All right. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Panos, for uh, today. Thank you, Anna, for the invitation. And thanks, uh, everyone I've met today. Very impressed with what you're doing here. It's really nice. Um, so I'm glad to have the opportunity to tell you a little part of what my group has been doing in the last few years at MIT. As Panos mentioned, we're interested in these microporous materials known as metal organic frameworks. I will spend just a couple of minutes explaining what these are for those of you who are not familiar with them, but they're essentially sponges, okay? Very, very high surface area sponges, very tiny pores. And I think what's important to understand about these is that um, I would say as structurally, they're most related to zeolites, very different compositionally than zeolites, but structurally, just like zeolites, they have nanoporous sort of structures, which is what gives them this very high surface area. So some of these materials can reach up to about 5,000 square meters per gram, which is certainly higher than almost anything out there, higher than even some of the best uh, high surface area carbons. So naturally, what people did and continue to do with these is to store small molecules, gases, hydrogen, CO2, um, other types of things. We do a little bit of that, but uh, my lab, when we started, we became interested in learning and exploring the chemistry of these materials, especially in the context of heterogeneous catalysis. I'll try to explain why we're particularly interested in uh, commodity chemicals, and you can imagine that because of the small pores, I really think that these can have an influence in catalysis, but not in pharma-type catalysis, where the substrates are usually too large to enter the pores. The other side of my lab is very interested in electronic materials, also based on MOFs. The idea being that if you have a high surface area material that you can also make electrically conductive, that would be very unusual because it's very hard to make highly porous materials that are also very electrically conductive. And if you can do that, you can start thinking about all sorts of applications, including things like thermoelectrics, where heat transport is really tough in porous materials, but if you can do something about electrical transport, then you have essentially an, an, a thermo, uh, thermoelectric. Uh, uh, energy storage, I'll talk a little bit about. We have some projects in interaction of MOFs with light and how the particular arrangement of chromophores and of particular metal ions can lead to some um, interesting behaviors there. Uh, but all of it really stems from the idea of how you can engineer charge transport in these types of materials. So I'll start with the first one on catalysis and reactivity. This is a view of a MOF, well actually that I made as a graduate student, it's just it's a picture that I still use 10 years later. Um, but one of the things that I became interested in is to explore the reactivity from the context of an enzyme, because I will argue that MOFs are actually close to enzymes when it comes to site selectivity and site isolation. You know, enzymes, of course, everybody knows they're just fantastic catalysts, and you can ask, well, what makes an enzyme a really good catalyst? Of course, there's many things that make enzymes very good catalysts, but from the perspective of the metal and the active site, you have weak ligand fields. What that means is that you have amino acids, right, like histidines, carboxylic acids, thiols, phenols. Um, and, and that's important because they give rise to high spin electronic configurations, open shell. Those tend to be more reactive both for reductions and for oxidations. And that's not just similar, but it's identical to the types of ligands that make MOFs, carboxylic acids, pyridines, thiols, and so on. So at least functionally, we can imagine that these will have a biomimetic a reactivity. Site isolation I already mentioned. Enzymes are the ultimate site isolated rea reactions or catalysts because the active site of an enzyme never sees another active site by definition. And then here too, this metal here is 10 angstroms away from this metal so they actually never meet each other. So I can eliminate a lot of the problems that homogeneous catalysts when it comes to dyeing. Multiple open metal sites. This metal here literally has four open coordination sites where I can attach points. And this is very hard to do with homogeneous catalysis where usually 
to get something that is too coordinate, you have to build some very bulky, sterically crowded ligand, but this is completely open. And so that's obviously important for reactivity. There are other things. Enzymes are not static. Enzymes move. They have dynamic motions, and uh, oftentimes it's those motions that give rise to selectivity for enzymes. MOFs are mostly characterized by X-ray diffraction. X-ray diffraction gives you an average of what happens over your collection time, but it tells you almost nothing about the dynamics of that structure. Are they tunable rationally? People who work in this area, there's hundreds of thousands of MOFs, and they will say, oh, it's rational by design, because I can take this ligand, and I can take this metal, and they'll make this type of structure. That's total trash, because all self-assembly processes are empirical. You can't actually define what structure you'll have. You can empirically predict what structure you'll have, but you can't decide a priori. So one of the things that we started doing is to try to change these metals from, say, manganese or titanium to something else, but without changing the structure. What are the types of questions you can answer by using this unique platform? And then finally, everybody talks about how MOFs are never going to be useful because they're not water stable. And this last question I'm going to address first, because it's partly true. But what makes it actually fundamental to answer is to realize that MOFs are actually molecules. Okay? And they are molecules that happen to sit pretty in a solid state structure. But otherwise, they are just literally salts made of metals and organic linkers connected by you know, some functionality, typically a carboxylic acid. So you can ask, okay, what determines the stability of a MOF? It's the metal ligand bond. That's the weakest bond in your material. That's going to define the hydrolytic stability, the thermal stability, everything. So, of course, if you take zinc and a carboxylic acid, that's not going to be very stable. That's literally a salt. So it'll dissolve in water. Um, but you can ask, an even deeper question, and that is the realization that any porous structure, any porous MOF, is actually metastable relative to a dense phase. And this is true of zeolites too. Zeolites are just isomers of silica, right? And so if you realize this, you say, well, okay, so then never, they're never going to be stable. There's nothing wrong with metastability. Diamonds are metastable. Nobody cares about that, right? Um, so what you care about then is the height of this kinetic barrier because you want to make them as kinetically stable as possible. Then once you realize that, you can ask, well, how can I make a salt as kinetically stable as possible? And you go back to literally first year chemistry and, and look at the most boring reaction in the world, which is the self-exchange of a water molecule on a hexa-equal complex with another molecule of water in solution. It's one of my favorite reactions even though it's so boring, because it tells you everything you need to know about the kinetics of various metal ions. So they tell you basically that things like copper 2 plus, calcium 2 plus, zinc 2 plus are very labile. That means they exchange really fast, right? Whereas something like even nickel, where's nickel? Right here. It's a million times slower than copper. So if you want to make a kinetically stable MOF or a stable MOF, you might want to work with nickel or with aluminum or with chromium-3 because then kinetics won't let the moth die. Okay? Um, so you increase the, the height of the barrier. Another way to increase the height of the barrier is to realize that if you go to so-called strong bonds, like zirconium-oxygen bonds, a lot of people like to work with zirconium-oxygen moths because they say, well, it's thermodynamically stable. Yes, but in essence, what you're doing is you're saying, here's my zinc-oxygen bond. It's a weak bond. That means that both the porous phase and the dense phase are unstable. Relative to a zirconium, where both the porous phase and the dense phase are more stable, which means that given the same transition state, this kinetic barrier is higher. Okay. So the point is that if you think about just simple kinetics and thermodynamics, you can make very stable MOFs. And so when we did that, we said, okay, well, we don't want to work with zirconium because it's not a very interesting metal when it comes to catalysis. We want to work with late transition metals. But unfortunately, those don't make, they tend to be labile. So you need to both use both thermodynamics and kinetics. 
So instead of carboxylates, which are pretty good acids, we went to azoles, which now if you put uh, nitrogens, you can get to something like pyrazole or imidazole, which are very weak acids. So now when you make the imidazolate, the anions, the pyrazolate, you end up having very strong bases. So then those metal, bonds, uh, uh, metal ligand bonds are stronger. So for instance, this is, this is one of my graduate students, Adam, he's now a postdoc. Um, he took this ligand, doesn't matter what it's called, I actually don't know what it's called. It's called BTDD. But um, uh, if you react this with cobalt or nickel, you end up making all the same structure, these hexagonal phases. They're incredibly stable to water. You can boil them in water, you can expose them to ammonia, you can expose them to radicals of chlorine and bromine, and they're completely stable. Okay, the point being that you can make very stable MOFs if you just think about basic principles. Are they tunable? Here's the most famous MOF out there, MOF 5. Maybe some of you have known about it. Um, this was published in Nature in 1999 by Omar Yagi. This paper alone has over 8,000 citations, I think, just one paper, okay? Which technically means that there's 8,000 people who have maybe made or at least read the paper. The structure of this is such that you have these zinc-4 clusters where the zincs are coordinatively saturated, sort of tetrahedral. What we found early on, actually, published this in 2015, is that the structure of Ma5 is not what people thought it was. One of the zinc atoms in Ma5 is actually octahedral. The way we figure this out is by doing zinc NMR, which I'm not sure I have it in here, I don't have time for it. The point is that you have to go outside of X-ray diffraction. You have to go to sophisticated crystal, uh, spectroscopic techniques to understand what are the dynamics of these metal ions in these structures. Then if you do molecular dynamic simulations, you realize that indeed, you know, DMF on a time scale of five picoseconds attaches to the zinc, it goes even octahedral and detaches from the zinc. And if it can attach to the zinc, it can actually pull the zinc out all the way. It can continue to solvate the zinc, it can pull it out. So what that told us is that Maybe we can just take MA5 and instead of relying on self-assembly, we can actually exchange it with something else. So if you want to make the MA5 structure with any other metal, you cannot. Not by self-assembly. Nickel doesn't want to make that structure. Nickel wants to make something else. Zinc cadmium wants to make something else yet. But you can take MA5 already pre-made, you can just soak it in a nickel nitrate solution what you'll see is that initially the crystals change to yellow, but then if you, if you pull them under vacuum, they, t they eventually turn blue. What happens is that the nickel replaces the zinc, but it doesn't want to be tetrahedral. This is going back to your you know, undergraduate in organic chemistry. It's D8. It doesn't want to be tetrahedral. It wants to be either square planar or octahedral. But once you force it in there, it doesn't have anywhere to go. So now you can pull vacuum on it and uh, what you find is that it has to sit there, it's unhappy. It goes uphill in energy because you're in an open system, but now it goes tetrahedral. This is sort of the proof of principle, but what we then found is that almost any MOF that we tried engages in this cation exchange. So now you can take literally any MOF out there and it has the structure that you want for whatever purpose and here are some of the clusters that we've exchanged. And you say, oh, you know, this has two open coordination sites. We can maybe do reactivity here and exchange it. But it can only be made with copper. You make the copper structure, and then you exchange it with nickel or chromium or vanadium, whatever. Okay? And that becomes powerful because now it allows you to ask questions that are both fundamental. For instance, I take this. I have site isolation now. So I can isolate very reactive intermediates, radical structures, peroxides, high, you know, superoxides, things like that, and put them in a bottle and do spectroscopy on them. I can also ask catalysis questions. This is now literally molecules that sit in a solid. So I can do, it's a heterogeneous system, but I have molecular level control over it. So what are the sorts of questions that I can do in heterogeneous systems? And this is just one example. Um, 
one of the things you can do as a chemist is go to a chemical engineer and say, okay, tell me what are the largest industrial processes that are homogeneously catalyzed? Because if industry had a choice, all heterogeneous large volume, pro all cat uh, catalysis processes would be heterogeneous because it's easier to process the, the system, to recover the catalyst, reuse the catalyst. So by asking the question as to what is the largest volume industrial process that is homogeneously catalyzed, that means that industry has tried a bunch of things, hasn't worked, but the process is so valuable that they're still using it. So one of those processes is ethylene dimerization. It's a simple reaction, well, seemingly simple reaction, because what you're telling ethylene is to dimerize and then stop, or polymerize and then stop because it could go to hexene and octene and decene and then polyethylene. And, and we need this, it's done on a 700,000 metric tons per year because it's a, it's a co-monomer in, uh, in the production of linear low density polyethylene. This catalyst is fantastic, titanium propoxide, very simple catalyst, homogeneous, 100,000 turn of very active, right, Ex extremely active catalyst, 93% selectivity of 1-butene, and it dies in half an hour. As an academic chemist, you look at that and you think the biggest problem with this catalyst is that it dies in half an hour. It's not. This thing is so cheap that industrially they continuously feed titanium propoxide into the reactor. It dies, but who cares, because it makes titanium dioxide and then they take it out of the reactor and they put it in a landfill. The biggest problem with this catalyst is actually the selectivity. Selectivity is not high enough. 7% on such a large scale, that means that you're wasting 7% of your ethylene, highly pure ethylene, to make this polyethylene. That's the mass, ma mass balance. And they, that stops the reactor. They have to stop the reactor for a week every month. Somebody goes in with a shovel to take the, the ethylene out and throw it away. So we say, can we do this? Here's a homogeneous catalyst that works okay, okay? This is not an industrial catalyst, but we thought we could make this better by putting it in a moth. So it's a boron-based ligand, so trisprazyl borate with nickel and a chloride. It's kind of faded here, but these are important. These mesethyl groups provide the steric balance that pre prevent another one of these ligands to come on top here and kill the catalyst. However, if you have these groups, that produces more polyethylene. If you were to have it on a site-isolated platform, you wouldn't have that problem. So we said, can we do this in a MOF? It turns out that the same ligand, that BTDD ligand, when you react it with zinc, makes a different structure, makes this structure, which now looks very much like a TP. Except instead of boron, you have zinc. Instead of pyrazoles, you have triazoles. But otherwise, this looks exactly identical, with the exception that you have now much more open system. You can see these arms here, are, they're leaving the nickel much more exposed. That is good for selectivity for 1-butene. And indeed, if we now look at this, we get 98% selectivity for C4. It's very similar activities, you know, over 40, 50,000. But the entire mass balance is hexene. So we don't make any polyethylene. And this is now a heterogeneous system. We work on many other types of applications like this that um, I think address and is where the niche for MOFs is in heterogeneous catalysis with these commodity chemical production that are currently catalyzed homogeneously with an in industry. Um, I'm going to spend the last part of my talk talking about the electronic properties of MOFs. And the question is, you know, why would you be interested in in transporting charges through porous materials? And the first answer is that it's just cool. <laughs> How do you think about transporting charges through a material that is mostly empty, not, not filled? Uh, because of course, charges want to travel through metals and things that are really dense and have many states, electronic states, that are close together in energy. So it's cool, but it's also, I think, once you eat say, well, if I could make a moth that's conductive, I could have all these things, you know. Um, I know some of you are interested in, in gas separations, and I think that this is a potentially new concept of 
separating gases where you have something that's very porous, very conductive, you apply a potential that could modulate in principle the adsorption energy of one of the components in a mixture and therefore separate the other. So there are lots of potential applications, electrocatalysis of course, ion conductors and so on. So you say, great, <laughs> let's do it. How do we do it? And again, I go back to the one of the things I said earlier, and that is that MOFs are molecules. The reason they don't conduct electricity is because they're molecules. They just happen to sit together in space in a sort of symmetric structure. So in essence, what you're trying to do is to make conductive molecular systems, but that also happen to be porous. There's lots of research on molecular conductors. They just are not porous. So we can learn from that research, and what have we learned? We learned that there are essentially, well, from a chemist's perspective, there are essentially three formalisms for charge transport. One is hopping of charges. This is what happens in proteins. You have ion sulfur clusters, electrons hop from one to another, get to the active site, you do chemistry. It's short range. This is not going to give you a wire. This is not going to give you a long wire. It's not going to like silver or copper. But it's possibly operative in many MOFs because you just have to have molecules that can accept or donate electrons within hopping distance of each other. Pi stacking, everybody knows about, right? This is what gives rise to conductivity in many charge transfer salts like TTF, TCNQ, which can be metallic. But you say, well, great, how do I engineer something like a pi stack in a MOF where pi stacks are fairly weak interactions? MOFs are defined by strong metal ligand bonds. You've got to get lucky to some extent. Through bond transport, there is the backbone. Why aren't charges transported through the backbone? And the answer is that, again, these are salts. And so most salts are not conductive. Why are most salts not conductive? Because the energy levels of the metal part and the, or and the organic part are not well matched. Think from the perspective of molecular orbital theory. If you have, I can write a molecular orbital picture for sodium chloride. That doesn't mean that sodium chloride is covalent, right? So I want to increase the covalency of that bond. And carboxylates, pyrazoles are just not going to do it. I have to match that energy level. I won't be able to go through all of them. We've written some reviews on, on this topic. You can essentially engineer all of them. Redox hopping, pi stacking. You, you get inspired from things like charge transfer salts and so on. Molecular chains. The point of this slide is that you can get to pretty decent conductivity values. If you're not familiar with conductivity, it's measured in Siemens per centimeter. Silver is something like 10,000 Siemens per centimeter, okay? But a semiconductor is actually anything between 10 to the negative 4 and 10 is considered, say, a semiconductor. Of course, there are other metrics that you can measure semiconductors by. So this is pretty good, okay? This is fairly conductive. This is kind of like wet wood, and this is dry wood, okay? Uh, <laughs> but um, one of the things that we noticed here is that if I want to make this now useful, you want to have non-isotropic, you want to have isotropic conductivity. So this is an infinite chain of TTFs. It's nice and chiral, and you can do all sorts of crazy experiments because it's a chiral conductor. But in the end, if you have a crystal like this that conducts this way, and then a crystal like this that conducts this way, and a polycrystalline device, this junction here will create a big resistance. So that's not good. Similarly here, I have an infinite chain of metal nitrogen bonds that conducts pretty well, but it's still a one-dimensional conductor. So what you want is to increase the dimensionality of delocalization to 2D and 3D structures. And so to do that, while well, you've got to have some pretty good students, we talked about how at MIT we almost never get <laughs> get students from Europe. It's because they never apply. When they do apply, this guy, for instance, Grigori, is my only Russian student and the only Russian who applied in the last 10 years at MIT. He got in. He's a fantastic student. In any case, we I love this slide because it's, it's, it's a history of, of inorganic chemistry in one slide in many ways. 1927, 1927, you know, it was the French and the Germans who did chemistry, really. So everything was, uh, was uh, you know, in, in two or three journals. Nickel chloride, phenylenediamine, in ammonia, you make a molecule. 
That's it. That's the report. What was interesting about the report is that the formula of the molecule is such that you lose two protons from each of the phenylenediamines to make a neutral molecule. Dick Holm was a professor at Harvard. He passed away last year. He was one of my academic grandfathers, actually. Wrote a paper in JAX by doing arithmetic, essentially, and saying, well, if this is a neutral molecule, I've lost four protons. That means that this nickel is nickel four plus. That was literally the only thing in the JAX paper. Because it's so unusual to have nickel four plus. Same year, or less, less than a year later, Harry Gray, again, someone that many of you will probably know, um, he came back and said the title of his paper was On the Myth of Nickel-4. <laughs> and he said, this is not Nickel-4. What's actually going on here is that I have a Nickel-2 with two extra positive charges on the ligands. You would call now this a redox non-innocent ligand. Um, this caught our attention because in 2003 it was proven that this structure was correct. And moreover, that these two radicals, they're indeed two radicals, but they're so strongly antiferromagnetically coupled at room temperature such that they look like a singlet. And so that means that these two electrons don't really care. They can travel through the metal node. That's what you want from a conductive moth. You want to travel through the metal node as if it weren't there. So you say, how can I use this concept to make a moth? You make a ligand like this now where you connect three of these phenylendiamines to a single ligand and you do the same reaction and you end up with this sort of hexagonal sheet that looks like graphene and it actually stacks like graphite but it has channels now so it's a porous sort of graphite and and the conductivity of this thing now is two Siemens per centimeter, 40 Siemens per centimeter in film, polycrystalline film. So this now gets to basically the same value of conductivity as graphite itself. But now it's manageable, it's tunable, I can change the nitrogen to oxygen, I can change the metal, I can do all sorts of things. Lots of interesting things here that happen that we still don't really know how to explain. For instance, if you look at the temperature dependence of the conductivity, and now we're looking at the small molecule, right? This is now just hexaaminobenzene. This is actually an interesting molecule. It's extremely electron rich, very electron rich. We, don't, we never isolate this. We actually use it as a salt. And it's made from trinitro triaminobenzene, which is not the best thing to work with. Um, but this guy, Jin Hu, he, he makes it on a 60 gram scale. So anyway, this is linear. So, in other words, the conductivity increases with temperature. This is the signature of a semiconductor because now you have temperature activated transport. However, a semiconductor should not have a linear behavior. should have an exponential or a, or a logarithmic behavior depending on how you look at it. So that's interesting. There's no single theory that sort of explains this. If you look at extended structure calculations, so you look at band diagram calculations made by us or other people, you know, independent of us, not even requested by us, they all predict this to be metallic, actually. So they predict this to be metallic. If you look at UPS, you see uh, this continuum of bands that, or the of electronic states that is a signature of a metal. So we have computational suggestions that this is a metal. We have some experimental evidence that actually contradicts the other experimental evidence, one that looks like a semiconductor, the other one that looks like a metal. So what we think is happening, although we don't have definitive proof, I'd love to hear some suggestions of how to look at this, is that what we have is a nanoparticulate metal where intrinsically each particle is metallic, but we have activated transport, temperature activated transport between particles. Okay? And that's our best explanation. The one of the reasons it's so hard to do measurements on these things is because it's very difficult to crystallize them as large single crystals. And the reason it's difficult to crystallize them as large single crystals is because even though the AB plane looks very nicely ordered, these grow as very long needles and very thin needles. And in the C growth direction, where the stacking direction is, there are essentially no preferential stacking sequences. So there's no order in the C direction. Uh, and you can see this in the TEM, it's kind of like wavy like that. Okay, so that's certainly not, not translational order. So we said, how can we actually improve this? Can we do that through molecular design? 
That's where Jin Hu comes in again, and he says, well, if we look, so I was saying how we wanted to change the way that these things stack. So we looked at the electron density map of, say, the original ligand, okay, these hexa-substituted uh, triphenylenes, versus a different core, where now we've changed the, the benzene core with these, tri uh, with these nitrogen exchanged uh, sort of heterocycles, you can see that these now is not quite as concentrated in the middle, and it's actually more distributed on the sides, and the middle is actually kind of electron poor. And what that allows is that when you have direct on top eclipse stacking, you don't actually have uh, electron density sitting against electron density, which is more favorable for pi stacking. Also, this ligand is slightly more acidic. Doesn't look like much, but one, one and a half pKa units makes it more, acidi uh, more acidic, which is better for crystallization in general. Anyway, long story short, when we use this ligand now, we get much better crystals. You can see, even see the, the defined edges here by TEM. And you can see, especially in the C direction now, this is perfectly aligned. Okay. And, um, and this allowed us to do a lot of single crystal measurements and some of the you know, really, really um, careful single crystal studies. Just a few words about applications. This literally looks like graphite, except it's porous and it's different composition. We can make pencils. This is a pencil made of a moth. We can draw it with it between two electrodes and we can use it for things like sensors, uh, chemi-resistive sensors. Um, long story about CO2, one of the things we want to do is detect CO2 at atmospheric levels. Turns out that's really difficult to do. Currently, it's done with either mass spec or infrared or something like that. But if you want to have a, sense, a CO2 sensor in every room that's, that, that's quantitative, that actually is really hard. And people have tried a lot of things, graphene, you know, conductive polymers. Humidity is the one that kills it because many of them work at high humidity but not low humidity. And our stuff works actually better um, in the 400 to 2,000 ppm range, which is unfortunately where we are right now with, with CO2. Lots of other potential applications in sensing. Electrocatalysis, this is just showing that it actually works quite well as an oxygen reduction catalyst, where in the absence of the MOF on an electrode, you have no activity. Then with oxygen, you have the highest uh, catalytic current here. We're doing a lot of things with electrocatalysis, but I will spend another five minutes or so on just telling you about energy storage. This is uh, something that's been going on for five years now in my lab. And other than batteries, actually, besides batteries, the simplest energy storage device is actually a capacitor. And a supercapacitor in particular is one that's uh, also known as an electrical double layer capacitor. The way it works is, I'm sorry for those of you already familiar, but this is just a conceptual image of Okay, you have some electrode at rest, you have the electrolyte, anions, cations are going to be distributed evenly or randomly. As I polarize this electrode, right, um, I'm going to have cations going against the electrode, but the anions will be left alone to concentrate it, and then the anions will say, hey, we want to hang out with the cations, so they'll go against the cations. And that's the origin of the so-called double layer, uh, in electrochemical double layer. But this looks like a capacitor now. So the capacitance of the capacitor increases with surface area. So what you need for a supercapacitor is highly conductive material with high surface area. And that's really difficult to do. All commercial supercapacitors are made of some sort of carbon. Activated carbon typically, but also carbon nanotubes, uh, graphene, graphite, other composites. So we said, can, can we make a moth-based supercapacitor? Uh, why, why not? You know, because we have something that's conductive now. So this is a typical electrolyte, tetraethyl ammonium tetrafluoroborate. You can do some simple molecular dynamic simulations to see that those fit. And this, these are some of the metrics. For a supercapacitor in a CV, a cyclic voltammogram, you don't want to see the typical uh, duck shape because that's indicative of a Faradaic process. A supercapacitor is intrinsically a non-chemical process, a non-chemical device. It, 
it just stores charge and it frees it. Right? This is why it goes for 100,000 cycles rather than 1,000 cycles like a battery. You want to see uh, symmetric charge, discharge curves at very high current, so even up to 2 amps. You want to see a lot of cycles. I'm showing here 10,000, but we've gone up to, to 100,000 without much loss. This is just 10% loss. And you also want to see very low internal resistance because if you have high internal resistance, Think about the applications for these things are usually cars, some other electrical devices. They're going to heat up. And especially for a car, heat dissipation becomes a big problem for the engineers. And so we have fairly low internal resistance. If you want to compare with other materials, what you want to do is to normalize the capacitance per surface area. And in that case, we're actually winning because this is not as porous as, as other MOFs. And so we have a very high capa normalized capacitance, as it were, actually better than almost anything else except for the so-called holy graphene, which is not holy, it just has holes, okay? Um, all right, so the point is that this works, um, and I think that was a movie, but, oh yeah, here it is. So that's the capacitor, there's, it looks like a battery, but it's just moth in there, and then my student is going to crank this shaft to show that this works, but he's going to bypass the capacitors first. Okay, just the bulb works. Now he's going to flip that switch, he's going to connect the super cap. As he's cranking this, he's also charging the super capacitor. Okay, and then when he lets that go, well, the bulb still works. Okay, and it's, it's a movie. So the, the cool thing about, it's a gimmick, okay, but it tells you that you can take something that people thought was completely insulating and you can store electrical charge in this little capacitor now. So we've managed to make the world's most expensive supercapacitor because this is obviously more expensive than, than activated carbon, right, or something else. But you can put it in the world's most expensive car. And uh, so we're actually now working with Lamborghini to make this, uh, hopefully. This is their, their concept car, and uh, this is me with with the Lamborghini leadership, they unveiled this prototype car at MIT a few years ago now. So we're still working on this, it's going well. Hopefully they'll have an electric Lamborghini soon. Um, all right, so I should finish. I'm thinking a little bit over time, but reactivity-wise, if you start looking at these things as molecules, and if you ask the right questions about, I think, what processes these could be useful for, um, there's a lot of chemistry to be had with these with these MOFs. Um, and so other reactions that we're interested in, things like carbonylations, hydroformylations, selective oligomerizations of alcohols, you know, polymerizations of simple substrates. Uh, fundamentally, we're taking care of, uh, advantage of this matrix isolation to isolate really reactive species like these hyponitrites. Um, activation of oxygen, something that we're getting ready to publish soon. On the electronic property side, there's a lot of fundamental interest in 2D materials, as you all know. But these turn out to have, uh, I would say, in many ways, more interesting electronic structures than graphene itself because they're hexagonal. So you still have that sort of Dirac-type cone. But now you're actually opening up a gap. And you can have unpaired electrons. So you can have magnetic properties coupled with this. So things like, these are, these are all papers with collaborators in, in theory and computational stuff where they predict that single sheets of these, just like with graphene, will show things like the quantum anomalous Hall effect, high temperature ferromagnetism. So we're trying to do this, but first we have to grow the crystals, exfoliate them, and then make the devices. Um, and in applications, you know, this is one of them, but as I mentioned, we, there's, there's a bunch of other things that we're working on. So with that, um, you know, we have other things, photophysics. I mentioned water, water harvesting is something that, that we're doing as well. Uh, this is a startup company that we have on uh, air conditioning, efficient air conditioning, and some other magnetic material. So with that, I want to thank my group. This is about, well, this is two, three years ago now. We haven't gotten together like this without masks in a while. So <laughs> this is the most recent paper picture I have of them. Uh, this is in my backyard in Boston. So 
Um, thank you for your attention. I don't know if you have time for questions, but hopefully.